Hello and welcome to MZ Webinars. Thank you for joining us today. Um, our presenters today are Andy Derman, who is the Managing Director of MZ UK, and also Duncan Brown, who is Senior Economist at MZ. Um, just so you know, you'll receive the slides and the recording after the webinar in a follow-up email, so keep your eyes open for that. It'll also give you um, uh, where to download your report from as well that you'll hear about in the webinar. Um, if you have any questions during the course of the webinar, please put them in the question box on your go to uh, go to webinar control panel, and we'll endeavour to get back to those at the end of the presentation. So, without any further ado, I'll hand over to you, Andy. Thank you, Debbie, uh, and uh, hello everyone, and happy New Year to you. Thanks for joining us today. I come to you from a rather drab and rainy. Basingstoke, um, but I know the weather is somewhat variant around the country. Colleagues I was speaking to earlier further north are uh, having a bit of a blizzard at the moment, so uh, hope if you're in that you're having some fun. Uh, anyway, welcome uh, to the first uh, major webinar on our side from uh, for 2021, and we're delighted to take the opportunity to, I suppose, look back on in retrospect at uh, what we can learn about what's happening in the UK labour market and has been happening over the last. 12 months or so as we as we all start to think about where where this is all going for us um, in the coming months and I hope we can shed some light and point you in the direction um, to find out more information that can be helpful to you in and your important work as we get about rebuilding our economy. I'm delighted to have Duncan Brown our uh, senior economist joining us who's contributed some good content over the last year or so and got some more fantastic graphs to be sharing uh, today. So hello, Duncan. Hello, Andy. Good to see you. Oh, yeah. Here. Yeah, <laughs> yes, indeed. Indeed. So um, in terms of today's session, then, uh, plan is for me to just quickly introduce MZ for any, any new faces uh, or, or, or listeners to uh, this webinar. Um, and then I will be handing over to Duncan for him to share a few insights that he's been um, uh, pulling together uh, for this session before he hands the back back, back, back to me to uh, take you through a few resources that will be uh, making their way to you very soon. I just wanted to give you a, a good heads up on that and point you in the right direction on those. And then of course we can uh, we can answer any questions that you have as we conclude today's session. So just very quickly then, and, and welcome to uh, long term. Um, followers of uh, the MZ webinar series, thank you very much for your support over o over the last year or so, and I hope that the content's been very helpful to you, and we, we are very keen to continue that. Um, but anyone new to MZ just wanted to say hello and welcome. Um, thanks for joining us, and just by way of a very brief introduction, just wanted to introduce who we are and what we do, and ultimately. At MZ, our goal is to really help organisations like yours and, and individuals that you serve to make better, more informed choices about the labour market. And we do that by building lots of detailed, granular, localised labour market insight to arm you with the best information you can possibly have upon which to make very important decisions. And of course, um, times like these and the uh, disruptive environment that we're in, um, data like ours has never been so important and, and critical to really helping um, not just your organizations think about positioning yourselves and um, for helping us in our rebuilding mission and, and maximizing the opportunities that are out there but also ultimately um, individuals who are um, thinking about their own uh, uh, contribution to the labor market and inclusion in the labor market whether now or down the line and so our mission really is about trying as, as hard as we can to illuminate that by bringing bringing forth the sorts of insights that we'll share with you today and and, and, and lots more in due course. So we'll talk a bit more about that as we go through. So Duncan, we, we had a session um, just as we closed out 2020 um, before Christmas. And, and in all honesty, in terms of the underlying data that we shared, shared there, um, not a, a massive amount has changed. But of course, the world outside has changed quite considerably. We weren't quite staring at, uh, quite anticipating what, what unfolded um, over the Christmas period and now um, here I am back at home rather than MZHQ as so many people are again as lockdown 3.0 kicks in. So we thought it would be helpful to I suppose recap a little bit on 
on, on what we covered off last time and any updates to that. But of course, within the context of this new environment that we're in. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Duncan. Uh, yep. Of course, feel free to chiv me, chiv me along with the uh, now official next slide, please terminology. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so I'm going to start by just reiterating the kind of the key messages that came about through our last webinar, because as you say, there's not a lot of new labour market data. I mean, on the official side, a lot of labour market data is delayed because uh, I, I guess people take time off for Christmas, which uh, is how unreasonable you might say. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't because I'm nice, uh, mostly. So um, uh, yeah, exactly. don't, don't you say anything, Andy. Um, so, um, uh, so I'm going to reiterate those. Uh, but yeah, I mean, as you say, the sort of the, the context has changed somewhat in 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 a bad way, in a good way. So the, the bad way is that we uh, um, uh, that Santa Claus bought us uh, an extra lockdown. Uh, um, well, actually, uh, what came along was a, 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 an explosive growth in infection rates and that's sadly translated through to hospitalizations and deaths as well um, and that's a, been a, a huge concern driven by the new strain um, and that resulted in the decision to return to a lockdown uh, the likes of which we hadn't seen since uh, sort of the uh, you know June time really with the schools closing and so on so it's been quite a, a, a dramatic change on the good side We've also seen the arrival of vaccination and its acceleration. And uh, uh, after a slightly sort of uh, up and down start, as of now, the UK is showing signs of getting really good numbers coming through. I saw um, uh, that there's been some information found today that suggests that um, the uh, UK will be able to ratchet up vaccination rates even faster. And of course, that's all so important because it offers the possibility of a sustainable uh, return to normality uh, in the future um, and so you know uh, uh, as much as the short term has been and remains tough um, the sort of the medium term outlook is getting brighter actually and so there is a, a sort of a, a partial end in sight even if there will remain issues about the coronavirus in society for uh, the foreseeable future uh, uh, according to the scientists but you know in terms of how we deal with it, it we look like having much more robust solutions. But so in, it's in that context that we can revisit those messages. So as it says there, what we know is that recruitment fell sharply and has recovered somewhat. And what we actually find is that, you know, a lot of the churn has gone away um, and certain industries have really recovered uh, uh, well. You know, some industries which were effectively switched off in Q2 have actually find, found ways of operating now that have enough social distancing that they can uh, uh, go back to work. And so you see this, especially in uh, industries like construction and manufacturing, uh, where many of those workplaces were closed. And of course, supply chains were affected as well in that period, whereas now they've uh, actually got some level of operation back to normal. Unemployment has risen. Vacancies have fallen and redundancies have started to rise. That pattern has continued. There was some more data released after the uh, last webinar, but it was pretty much in the same pattern. Uh, and generally, it's not as much as we might have feared. And that's because furlough has so far looks to have been a very effective intervention, at least in the short term. It stopped businesses having to shed lots and lots of workers, hopefully with the vaccine, uh, coming through and the, the lockdown hopefully having some effect and we are seeing the case numbers trend down now um, in a few months time we'll begin to see some reopening um, and then as you get into the summer even more um, and so actually the, the sort of the hope is that furlough will end and most of those workers who've been furloughed will find their way back to their old jobs there'll be some that won't and it's that sort of element that we'll have to see um, Industry experiences are very different, as I was talking about earlier, and it's the hotels and restaurants that are the big exception here, and arts venues and museums and things like that uh, go along with them. Where you know, with a lockdown, there's just so little that they can do in terms of operation, and so uh, it's that part of the economy which is the one that uh, uh, needs to recover um, uh, when we do return to some normality, and that will probably take some time. But you know, much of the rest of the economy seems to have been found a level of activity that it can continue with. 
Um, and so, as it says there, different roles face different risks. And probably the most important thing I think we found last time was this thing about the different workers also facing different risks. And so we see that sort of young male and foreign national workers have been those most greatly affected. In fact, on the latter point, uh, the data we reviewed that time showed that uh, there were more British national uh, 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 British citizens in employment in October last year than there were in October the year before, which is quite a, a surprising finding, really. Uh, 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 most of the uh, uh, reduction in employment experience so far has been actually uh, um, uh, uh, those from EU accession countries who don't seem to become unemployed. They seem to have uh, 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 left entirely, perhaps, to return to their home country. And so, um, yeah, uh, and, and we finished with that question there. But if you can go to next slide, please, as because uh, uh, I have got a few extra charts um, because we uh, we want to start to get a handle on what's actually happening now. And so, what I did was here, I looked at our job postings data, and this is new postings. So this is the number of postings that are actually arriving uh, onto the internet from the period uh, of first of November, so the beginning of. The sort of the uh, the second lockdown, lockdown two, um, up until uh, this week, um, and I compared it to the same period in 2019. And so overall across the UK, the volume was 14% down. So a lot better than we'd seen earlier in the pandemic, even though there was that lockdown there uh, in November, and then in the more recent period we've had a return to it. And what's really interesting is the sort of the the, the variance between the different. Uh, areas where you've got a place like Wales, which has got uh, significantly more job postings than there were before, um, perhaps even more now. Uh, the factory in Wrexham is uh, um, uh, bottling uh, vaccines. Um, uh, but um, whereas a place like London is still more than a third down in the Christmas period. Now, of course, London is quite an interesting one in a couple of ways. One is that it's very high turnover labour market, lots of comings and goings between different uh, places and the current environment probably needs a lot less of that between furlough and working from home and then the other side is of course London's got lots of visitor attractions that in November would probably still have been recruiting for the Christmas period and given the lockdown and then the move to tier four for uh, uh, large parts of the southeast and, uh, 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 and the situation in London uh, as it evolved as well um, uh, a lot of those jobs probably didn't come to fruition as they would normally at Christmas. And I think London has a particular uh, uh, exposure to some of these questions that we talk about in terms of the hotels, restaurants, arts and visitor attractions uh, because of its uh, 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 place in the UK, really, where it has so many of those things all concentrated together in the centre. And so if you can go to the next slide, please. And uh, we've also got some official data that uh, we can start to look at. So uh, um, uh, in terms of the changes in jobs within regions. And so this is using the ONS workforce jobs data, um, which is released quarterly. And we can see that the sort of the moves in jobs are relatively muted compared to the changes in recruitment. And that makes sense because recruitment is quite easy to just accelerate and decelerate. And suddenly, if uh, people are uh, not taking on workers, they'll just uh, have a, a quite a sudden stop on recruitment, whereas actual job numbers might only change slowly. Um, and so you can see it's, uh, I think it's about 2.8% jobs uh, lower in Q3 of last year compared to Q3 of the year before. But again, there's a bit of a regional spread, but it's quite a different one to the recruitment picture. So you see, for example, the Northwest, which has a, an increase in uh, job postings has seen a, sl a slightly above average fall in job numbers and then the West Midlands has had the biggest fall as well and so that's the thing recruitment you always have to take uh, 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 as being at one remove from the actual movement in jobs because lots of things can drive recruitment activity and so you can see there London for example is you know pretty much uh, at the lower end of the middle of the pack and so it's big fall in recruitment isn't translating through to changes in job numbers yet and so important to get that clear really and then if you can go to the next slide please so um, one of the things that we've done this year or last year now uh, is use the furlough data to identify the exposure of different industries given their uh, um, um, level of furloughing that's been going on um, and we can use that for uh, uh, different regions to look at uh, um, how exposed they are given their mix of concentrations. So we use a location quotient here, which is a measure that uh, many of our normal uh, customers and uh, webinar viewers will be used to. But for the uninitiated, a location quotient is a ratio of the 
sh industry share of employment locally to the share nationally. So if it's above one, then it's a relative concentration. And the exposure index is the percentage of jobs that are disrupted by COVID as measured by furlough. And so I've picked out here the Southwest, and we've got some more data in a, a bit on the Southwest, so I thought it'd be good uh, uh, to look at this. And so this gives us the one digit industries for the Southwest, where on the X axis, we've got that location quotient. So the further uh, out to the uh, right hand side, um, uh, um, it, uh, an industry is the more concentrated it is in the region. And then on the Y axis, we've got the COVID exposure. And so you look at um, uh, the accommodation and food service activities industry. Obviously, the Southwest has Devon, Cornwall, uh, Dorset, and so on there. So it's obviously a big uh, hot spot for um, uh, hospitality and tourism. Arts, entertainment, and recreation is also up there. And of course, they're both heavily exposed. So it's no surprise that the Southwest does score quite heavily for exposure to the coronavirus, whereas there are other regions that are much less. And you can see. Uh, uh, the interesting ones there are manufacturing and construction, which we get the sense have moved back significantly on the furloughing uh, points. And, and so uh, although there's some exposure in this region, in those elements, it's probably more uh, uh, secure now. But on the ones at the top right, it's still uh, much more open. And so, uh, yeah, it gives us a sense of where we are. Uh, but I think in a, a month or so's time, we'll begin to know quite a lot more. Um, next Great. slide, please. And I think I'm handing back to you to discuss the new um, report that we're releasing. Yeah, absolutely. So I think some really, really interesting context and, and that analysis is, is leading us very nicely into, into what we'd like to share that is, um, is brand new and hot off the press uh, for everyone. So thanks for that, that contextual information. And, and you will have picked up from that uh, from the analysis that Duncan's just shared there and, and previous analysis. And a big part of our focus, of course, is the fact that you know, the, the, the impact that COVID is having, whilst um, of course a national and global challenge, Certainly on the economic side, we're starting to see it impacting in different ways. And as Duncan mentioned in the summary, um, different industry exposure and different role, job role type exposures. And so what we wanted to do as we as we um, uh, see 2021 kicking off was to really bring a bit more of that insight um, to bear um, and to share that so that that can be helping helping build um, knowledge, insight and understanding. And of course, you know, the, the, the big phase that we hope we're all heading towards uh, very much so is thinking about, right, where do we go from here? Um, we spent a good chunk of the of, of 2020, certainly on the MZ side, just illuminating, hey, what's, what is happening? How do we understand that? Uh, now our attention um, very much is moving towards, so what can we do about it then? And so, um, I'm really excited to announce um, this new report that you can see on the screen there where we're looking to share a few highlights as we start to move the, the thinking in those directions. So um, we have uh, this new report, which is, uh, I suppose, really a summary fact pack, picking out a few key labour market highlights that integrate some of the, uh, the different data points that we've shared thus far, notably around where that exposure lies. Um, and, and uh, in industry and occupational terms, as well as what we can see emergent, re-emerging in terms of hiring activity. And we pulled that together in a bit of a, a compendium uh, of insights, um, uh, looking not just at the, the UK as a whole, but actually starting to break it down into the, uh, each of the different regions of England and devolved nations. So we can really start to pick out, much like we saw with the uh, Southwest example there, just a few highlights that can hint towards um, what what the next few months and the rest of this year might might um, hold based on that um, uh, industry and occupational mix, and actually digging even further into picking out exemplars uh, uh, in terms of principal cities in in each region. So I, I would like to very quickly just walk you through one or two things in the report, so that as and when um, you get your hands on it, you can hopefully um, get to the the stuff that you need, uh, the insights that you need straight away, as well as talking a little bit about where, where you might go from there. So um, talking of that regional focus, one of the things we've tried to do is, is paint a, a picture of the key traits uh, associated with each of those different um, regions so that you can either look right across the UK if you have a national focus to, to look at variation or if you, ha if, if you have a particular focus on a particular part of the country, hopefully we can uh, help you zero in on that. And 
here's an example from the report look looking at the southwest as a continuation of, of Duncan's analysis um, summarizing a lot of what 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 he shared there and I suppose the the challenge from from uh, the southwest region's perspective is is that significant increase on uh, the claimant count uh, change so that green uh, graph there 131 percent increase over that time frame which uh, is uh, significantly above the national average that we've seen um, and actually fits with the rest of the south of uh, the south of England, London, South East and East England in, ter in turn that are also um, very high in those respects. But the, uh, I think the big challenge uh, certainly is not just that raising claimant count, so a, a hint towards unemployment, but also um, actually it's the one region that's really struggled to see uh, a return uh, in hiring activity. Uh, Duncan had mentioned London and London is the only other region that really is, is is feeling that pinch and it's very interesting as we take the southwest and say compare it to the east of England which uh, also sees um, a, a high growth in, in un unemployment but has quite a different uh, view on the job posting uh, activity with uh, which has actually returned to uh, growth above pre-pandemic levels um, so um, similar unemployment look, but quite a different outlook in terms of hiring activity. And and the big question that we want to be answering and we want to help you answer really is the why question. And Duncan hinted at it around understanding the industry profile. And if we actually compare those two regions, just picking out again just some some headlines from that from the from the report, we can see in the southwest we've got the top. Top industries here by that location quotient measure, so those those important relative importance industries, and we've added a little bit more colour in terms of the size of the uh, the workforce heading into the pandemic and what the value of those industries are to the to the economy. And it's it's really quite profound that when you look at the southwest, those top five industries uh, groupings based on the specialism are all in classified within the medium to high range of the uh, COVID exposure index that we've explained previously, which probably points towards some of the um, extreme challenges the Southwest are uh, feeling. And as we look at the occupational level and think about uh, job posting, so those niche occupation, uh, occupational areas, we've had you know, some, some quite significant contractions. And certainly whilst there's been strong growth in some parts, of, of the local economy, it's not been across the board. And again, um, when we look at the exposure index, we can see that there's a, um, a decent amount of those occupations, sadly, in those um, challenging areas, as opposed to the east of England, which whilst unemployment wise has maybe seen a similar trend, has quite a different outlook on, on the uh, employment side. And um, if, as we look at those top five industries, we can see quite a different mix. Okay, so the the veterinary activities seem to have, uh, have have a decent amount of exposure, but actually those those niche industries that are really driving the east of England economy uh, seem to be, in general terms, le less exposed to disruption and therefore hopefully retaining, uh, not just retaining employment in those fields, but also driving continued growth um, throughout um, the challenging period. And again, as we look at some of those key occupations that were key occupations heading into the pandemic, um, they have uh, certainly those top two have really, really rebounded strongly as I think we've all adjusted um, to uh, in, in, into the the new normal of uh, of, of, of periodic lockdown uh, period uh, activities. And again, the exposure index shows us um, that they're um, more greens than than ambers there compared to the southwest. So, you know, evidence once again, and hopefully evidence we're bringing to your your fingertips that really that that industry mix that different localities were taking into into uh, the pandemic um, unknowingly um, is really affecting how we're responding during the pandemic, and and um, probably will give us some very strong clues in terms of how regions will re-emerge and where where the strongest bets are. So um, in terms of it, it, just to summarize, I suppose, um, here and, and feel free to jump in, Duncan, if you have any particular um, additional thoughts on this, but, but really uh, whilst of course it has been a universally challenging time right across, 
there is that quite considerable disparity that really is emerging through industries and occupations. But the fact that different regions have quite a different mix of employment um, is really starting to kind of uh, come to bear. And of course, we're now heading in, or we are in lockdown 3.0, which we weren't anticipating when we last uh, ran a session like this. And of course, you know, so so what might that mean um, for for those industries that are, are super reliant on those those key sectors? Um, so yeah, a big big challenge out there in that respect. Um, yeah, I, I mean, if I, I I can just jump in on that one uh, particularly, I think that um, this will also really um, tell according to how long it takes to get back to normal you know you can see a scenario where that's early summer or late summer um, and um, bearing in mind the most affected industries remain those that are kind of hospitality related and the same applies to the art sector as well as I said earlier um, you know those regions which are more touristy um, uh, when normality returns will make a huge difference to their wider economy because if you've got a tourist dependent economy you've been through one bad summer already uh, having another bad summer would uh, uh, not be good whereas on the other hand if there's a, an early return to normality providing it's sustainable given the, the sort of the the, the, uh, the the pandemic situation then it does offer the opportunity for those uh, regions to come back whereas those regions with the smaller uh, uh, sort of hospitality sector, a more normal one, you know, local restaurants for, for sort of uh, uh, people in the area, um, uh, they will be in a much better position in all likelihood much sooner. Um, yes. And so, yeah, the sort of the industry mix, and I mentioned about London, uh, which is a very particular uh, um, uh, situation, but the same applies to places like sort of Denham and Cornwall, uh, to the Lake District and so on and so forth, where, you know, uh, that th those economies are, are built on having large numbers of people coming to ex have a good time and so uh, being able to get those industries back in operation again will make a huge difference. Absolutely and Cornwall will still be as beautiful as ever um, <clears throat> post post pandemic and like to think there you know to, to my fourth bullet point there you know we will see as as those restrictions ease um, not just lockdown, but the tiering, etc. We we should see see general recovery, of course. Um, I can't wait to go to a pub. I'll be honest and take the family out for a meal or what have you. Um, I'm sick of my own cooking, <laughs> but uh, um, I I um, yeah we we I think pre realistically in terms of what can we do right here right now to support localities, it really is in those low exposure sectors where some are actually really thriving, quite frankly, and struggling to hire and to recruit. So yeah. uh, whilst um, it is easy to focus on the negative, one thing we do like to try and do here at MZ and, and, and support you guys is to think not, not just where the challenge lies, but also where the massive opportunity lies and how we can embrace that and maximize that. And so as much as the, the natural tendency will to be, look at the, to be looking for the reds and ambers and, and worrying about what those mean, I think the exciting thing, as we saw these the, for the east of England, is there's plenty of greens there, which really are driving opportunity. Um, and um, the challenge will be how we how we harness those opportunities. Um, and, and and as I think we we've, we've been pointing out for some time, but this report is really aimed to to kind of help your thinking on um, that granularity of focus is going to be critical. The, you know, the rubber meets <laughs> getting the rubber on the road it really happens in the very specific local economies um and so as you dealt we've already dealt from uk down to government office region equivalent and showed significant variation of course as you dig even further into localities you get greater and greater variation in different um situations and and and, and as example just picking those two focus regions and picking the 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 the, the sample principle uh, urban area um, from from each. Um, we saw the southwest as a whole, but when you look at Bristol, uh, the Bristol page, you see quite a different mix of key industries that have a very different um, exposure score. So while so so Bristol is very much not representative of the southwest as a whole, and vice versa. And so um, so how 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 we might maximize opportunity and manage challenge in Bristol is quite different perhaps to, to the Southwest as a whole. Similarly, looking at Norwich here, 
um, quite quite different indeed to the east of England, which is a, a broad and diverse region. So um, really important to, 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 to dig down, dig into the localities because we don't have that single uniform economy uh, across the UK. Uh, every every locality has its very in, uh, unique mix. There's a lot of commonality, but a, a hell of a lot of difference, and the difference is really coming to bear right now um, in these uh, in, in these uh, disrupted times, for sure. Uh, there. So really, where where do we go from here? And I think my 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 plea to you, and and, and I suppose a reflection on why we do what we do and how we do it, is really we want to illuminate what's happening on on the ground at that locality. And and I, and, and I just implore you to continue to think about your specific area um, that you influence and can influence. And and posing two two questions here really, which is continuing to understand where the the negative chat exposure lies and how you can manage manage through that. Obviously, we have a number of national schemes, but also a lot of local interventions can be deployed. Uh, and then similarly, I think as we all lift our heads up and think about um, where we're going now, of course, if we can help, you know, if, if you can illuminate those beacons of strength, as I've called them, I think those are the ones to really back. That's where the opportunities lie right now, but also are probably going to be the drivers as we as we get get things revving again in our local economies. And to do that, of course, you need good data and insight. Um, and, and that's what we're, we're here for, and we're here to help. So I'm very excited uh, to be releasing this uh, report. So uh, the, the summary national report with the regional and, and um, selected city outlooks will be available from tomorrow. All being well, there's the URL. You can uh, go forth and request uh, and download your report from there. We will be sending, I believe, a report to, to everyone who uh, attends this webinar anyway. But we will also be, um, uh, we've built a whole series of local authority and LEP region reports as well that you can request from us. So if you head to that URL, give us your details and let us know which region you're interested in. We'll provide a bit more of a summary for your local area, which hopefully will just um, um, make sure we can pick out some of the the trends that we've got in the main report and, and give them for your specific locality if you're not one of the chosen few sectors uh, cities sorry that, that, that we've picked out in the main report so do do go ahead and request those and we'll we'll share we'll share those with you in due course i do also want to point out a few other uh, resources um as well so we've been busy working with a number of customers to to build out a, an even more uh, exhaustive view so a lot of the, the trends that we've been sharing here we can we can build together into a very simple to read and understand report and um, that's available for you to, to request we've got different flavors of it for different uh, types of uh, groups colleges local local areas local um, local economic developers etc so um, do do reach out if you'd like to learn more about that and and how you can uh, purchase that report uh, and we can tailor that to your specific uh, interest area and locality and of course as many of you here uh, on on this webinar will will already be um, good long long term MZ customers you know all of that data that's fueling a lot of this analysis lies in MZ data sets and in MZ data tools and 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 our mission is to get as much of that into your hands so you can be bringing your own local um, uh, analysis uh, to to the data that we have for your locality so again I uh, just want to point out that if you want to just get your hands on the actual data itself that's all available via our analyst platform and the variants uh, tools that we have there and please do reach out if you want to learn more about that so we can let you know what's in there how you can get your hands on it and how how you can share that with colleagues as well and, and really get using um, specific relevant data to your local area to feed into your own um, activities and tracking what's happening in your local area. A couple of quick dates for your diary as well. Um, uh, we've got a, a really quite um, uh, solid plan of um, sharing content um, through our webinar series over the next um, certainly few months and will be throughout the year as the agenda uh, develops out, out there. Um, for our further education and general education and skills um, uh, uh, followers, um, we're hosting a webinar on the 20th of January 
really thinking about how skills development and curriculum development can, can really align to what we're seeing in local economies, both in terms of the underlying long-term direction of travel, but of course, how we can empower skills providers to, to really lean into the challenge um, of rebuilding our economy as, as we emerge from the, from the COVID pandemic. So I'd encourage you to, to check that one out. Um, and actually a really interesting one and developing that theme um, a little later on in the month um, is um, bringing together MZ's FE and uh, economic development uh, leads um, uh, and experts to, to think about uh, and showcase how colleges and LEPs are working ever more closely together on regional skills planning, certainly with the skills advisory panel work that's going on. We're, we're privileged to be uh, play a significant part and see our data helping to really connect colleges and local um, economic planners to, to connect together. And again, with the, um, the challenges facing our local economies, a, a, a real joined up approach is going to be critical. So I think that'd be a really interesting webinar to hear how that's happening already in the field and how that might develop out. Um, and, and also, um, Duncan and I will be coming back together in about a month's time. So we've got it scheduled for the 25th of February, where we'll be doing our next kind of review of what's happening in the labour market. Um, and, and we'll certainly be tracking the impact that lockdown 3.0 is having. Um, and I think, you know, certainly uh, in the discussions that we've had, our, um, our focus will be heading towards thinking about some of those where do we go from here type questions. So we'll continue to, to track our employment activity. Unemployment is, is trending through this lockdown period as new data emerges and share that with you. Um, but also some of those themes we've been talking about, I think we'll start to zero in on in terms of um, what, what, what does the new horizon look like as we, as we uh, head hopefully for sunnier uh, climes. And so, um, um, be, be sure to get that in your diary and you can sign up at the uh, web address URL that uh, I've mentioned on the screen there. So um, with that in mind, uh, Debbie, I'd like to hand back to you and um, see if we have any questions that we might be able to knock off between us. We've got a bit of time, unusually for us. Um, still <laughs> left. So, uh, interested to hear any feedback or questions. Okay, so um, one question here. How do the skills match between exposed on low exposed industries? Are they like for like or are we seeing a disjunct and therefore possible increases in unemployment? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think it does. Yeah, I, I think um, this is a good question. The, the sort of the most exposed industries are those that actually require relatively um, lower skills overall. It's not university the case. I mean, restaurants is a fascinating one because uh, um, there's a large part of the industry which is relatively low skill, and then there's a part of the industry which is really extremely high skill. Um, but overall, you know, if you think about the sort of the, the number of people in hospitality roles, um, um, they are sort of relatively a low skill, whereas those that are not just not exposed, but are actually growing, you know, you think about logistics roles are also not particularly high skill roles as well. So actually, there, it's not too bad. There's probably the, the, the bigger issue that we found when we've looked into this is the sort of the middle skill roles that you get in some of the more exposed industries that if they do get displaced, they might find difficulties finding jobs elsewhere. Because, you know, if you think about restaurant managers and chefs, which are the sort of the the, the, the more skilled roles in this sort of the food service industry, um, their skills are not so easily applicable uh, to other roles directly. And so there's a risk that they may have to bump down if they get displaced into low skill roles, which is not ideal. Um, the, the best hope is that we can see a recovery before too much of that has to happen. But if not, then that might be where interventions are best uh, uh, focused, really. Yeah, so what it does. No, I was going to say, following on from that, um, it says, what are the implications for skills policy and implementation? Um, well, I, I think um, the main thing is, is that at this point, I think um, uh, real need to be flexible and adaptable. The upside of furlough being successful in the short term is that we don't have a large body of people who are sort of um, um, already in unemployment and therefore we can focus our efforts on to reskill and adapt. Um, 
but that might change. We don't know, we hope not. We hope that there won't be such a huge surge as we probably anticipated back sort of even six months ago, let alone eight or nine months ago. Um, uh, but there, there will probably be some fallout from the end of furlough. There probably are some businesses out there that are kind of uh, uh, have some workers furloughed and when they return, there won't be a job out there for them. Um, my hope is that it's quite a small number, but, but we'll uh, have to wait and see. And I think that's the thing that we have to be ready to uh, act quite aggressively uh, to deal with whatever the situation throws us at, at us as we begin that return to normality to support um, the, the sort of the return to work of those industries that are most affected and those workers that are displaced to get back into work. Um, one of the interesting questions is whether there'll be lasting effects. I mean, the, the funny thing is those industries that are most affected um, in large parts of the country, the exception being those that sort of uh, have a stronger uh, tourism and visitor economy dimension, in, in large parts of the country, you know, if you think about your typical regional economy, the restaurant and hotel sector is effectively um, uh, uh, reflective of the local economy's spending power. So, you know, if you live in a prosperous area, you probably have a few more restaurants and so on. And, and so in those regional economies, um, uh, as people can go out again, they'll have money to spend and they'll want to go to restaurants. And so the situation will uh, be good. Whereas the more touristy areas, and in London, there's an additional factor of commuters, um, uh, um, that might take longer to adjust back and for people to sort of venture uh, back to their old ways. And in, in London's particular case, if there's a sort of a, a lasting effect of uh, working from home, then that might have implications as well for which workers get affected. And so all of these kind of variables will uh, reveal themselves in full, is my guess, uh, in sort of the, the middle of this year and thereafter. And it's at that point that we'll be able to sort of have a, a much clearer idea of how skills policy can best respond. So in the meantime, it's best to sort of uh, prepare ourselves for being adaptable and flexible, uh, keeping an eye on what's actually happening, who are being displaced um, and standing ready with the interventions necessary. And uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, it's the kind of the, the more middle skill roles, the level three, level four sort of roles. That I think are, are going to be the sort of the, the most important from a policy point of view about making sure those workers, if they are displaced in a more medium term way, that they can find their ways to other roles of similar skill level rather than being bumped down uh, to find a, a, a new career, which may take some time and reflect a loss of human capital in the interim. And I do think, um, if I might <clears throat> jump in, I think what this pandemic has highlighted is the need to really shine a brighter light on skills uh, as opposed to just simply looking at qualifications and jobs and really starting to think about what skills are actually in demand, um, where, where there is transferability where, versus where there is uniqueness. And I think coming back to the original question, um, it does vary by the types of roles that are being affected as to whether there is transferability or not. But the, the pragmatic reality is, is, is needing as an individual to really understand what does the work that you have done before you actually mean in terms of the skills that you have and where do we find those elsewhere in more of the in-demand parts of the economy. And as Duncan mentioned, there's probably in general terms uh, the lower skilled areas, ironically, probably is more adaptability um, and, and right at the top end, uh, significant adaptability. And I think the big concern is in the mid, mid range roles where where there are very vocational niche skills um, um, that um, um, maybe don't quite have that same uh, that same transfer ability. But what it does mean for skills policy to the point of Duncan's adaptability and flexibility is probably needing to think quite differently about how we view the connection between skills and work and um, the role that uh, large qualifications versus uh, small scale skills development activities and, and certainly the debate about continuous education certainly in the workforce I think um, needs to be front and center in my view because COVID is an example of a disruption. It's the first real big disruption we've had for some time, but we know Brexit has happened and that also that's one wind automation is always in the back of our minds and all of these themes 
are pointing towards the need to a um, have a clearer understanding of uh, of what skills are actually in demand and how that demand is changing and that's certainly something we are working tirelessly to illuminate uh, and b to, to to think about how individuals understand their own skills portfolio um, and we will be sharing a bit more on some of that, but, but certainly um, be launching a, a prototype very soon here in the UK that might might have some clues as to some of that um, that, that that kind of uh, ability using data like MZ's skills library to really uh, unpick some of that. I would also add just quickly before our next question, Debbie, um, that I think as we look to that uh, lockdown 3.0, the impact webinar, I think probably skills, I would imagine Duncan analysis of what we're learning about skills will feature quite highly in that webinar. So be sure yeah, to check that. Yes, okay. very much. That's great, guys. Thank you. Um, I think that's all the, the questions. So uh, thank no, you very much. Great to, to us today. Normally we get loads of questions and we don't get time to answer them. So apologies there, guys. But um, if, if that's that, I think the main thing I just want to encourage you to, um, to to check out the link. Go get that report. Should be helpful to pick out a few highlights for your region of interest and, and be sure to request your local report so we can get something helpful to you. And, and look, we are here to and we have the data and we have the tools and the expertise to really illuminate some of um, what's going on in your local area and we want to help so please do reach out and uh, give us a shout but uh, thank you very much i'll hand back to you now debbie to close out yeah that's great thank you very much for attending and we'll see you at our next webinar thank you bye-bye bye-bye